Hey everyone, uh, great to be here. Um, I'm going to be speaking a bit on the growth stage tomorrow, about uh, just about ritual and 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 the real story uh, behind our growth and and what we stand for as a company. Uh, but I thought I'd just do a quick preview for for everyone today about um, about what I'm going to be speaking about tomorrow. So, so our our sort of view of the world is that in the same way that uh, retail went through a digital transformation and um, and, and most recently, uh, transportation went through something very similar. Uh, we see local as going through that, that transformation as well to digital. And uh, what I mean by that is the way that we believe that the way that people will discover, uh, transact, and build relationships with local businesses is fundamentally going to change over the next 10 years with this, with this shift to digital. Um, so, so for people, for those of you who are familiar with, uh, with, with the Ritual app, um, you know, you, you hit a button on your phone and coffee and lunch is, is ready for you in seconds when you get there. Um, but th th there's a lot more behind the scenes of, of we see that as like the, the basic building block of the types of digital experiences we're looking to build uh, to help people connect better with local businesses. Um, and so our rewards program is a, is a really big part of that. Um, and about two years ago, we launched a, a power feature called Piggyback that allows, we now have uh, over 100,000 teams globally that use this product. It basically allows people within companies to share coffee and lunch pickups with each other. Um, and it's, it's, it's in effect, it's the only way that you can actually get a $2 coffee you know, brought to your desk with, with no delivery fees um, at, at all, which is a pretty big deal. Uh, so it's fundamentally changing the way that um, even, even delivery or, or um, the way that food gets to people in, in dense urban environments. So something that we haven't really talked about uh, before was what this means for, for, for businesses. So I think there's a lot of focus on, on the convenience for people. Uh, but, but for businesses, they're, they're, their businesses are fundamentally changing. So if you're a restaurant today, um, the, the, the core skill set of what it means to operate a, a business is changing over the next five or six years. It's sort of similar to retail, uh, where now we're, we're sort of moving into a world where there's a lot of data. And so, um, we, we, see it, we see ourselves as building the equivalent of you know, Google Analytics for, for a local business, right? Being able to measure your customer retention rates, satisfaction, uh, what is the lifetime value of a customer, some, some basic questions that a lot of businesses you know, need to answer to be able to run their businesses successfully. So um, that's a big part of our, our focus and how we think about building product. And just to, just to end here, um, we've had, we've, the way that we've approached growth has been uh, it's been a bit counterintuitive. Uh, we started super small and super slow. Um, we, it took us two years to launch two cities. Um, and we, we went through countless iterations of, of how, how, to, how to go about launching. Um, and I think I, I really credit our success four years later with how slow and how, and how small we really started. Um, and to put that into, to put growth into perspective now, you know, we operate across 25 cities and in, in, in four countries. Um, we grew our team four times in the last 18 months. Um, you know, our first million orders took, took almost two years to do, and, and, and our last million was done in just, in just over two weeks. So um, it gives you some sense of, of the growth that we're experiencing, and I'm excited to, to share more of the story uh, tomorrow on, on the growth stage. So hope to see some of you there. Thank you. This next company comes all the way from Sao Paulo, Brazil. But the idea for the company was born when the two co-founders were struggling to find accommodation when they were at colleges in the United States. So introduce us to the future of housing. Please welcome the CTO and co-founder of Quinto Andar to the stage, Andre Peña. Hello. I'm a co-founder and CTO at Quinto Andar, and I'm here to address the fact that people are moving more and more often from one house to the other, and they are buying fewer properties. Let me use myself as an example. So I left my parents' house when I was 18 years old, and I went to the university, then I went to work, and I lived in a few places. Then I moved to California for an MBA, came back to Brazil to start Quinto Andar, and in the last five years, I've lived in five different apartments myself. So let's take a look at my parents' story. My parents, on the other hand, 
still live in the same place. So this is a clear difference between generations. The current generations moves much more often, and this mobility is more compatible to renting than it is to buying a place. Renting, however, is still a hassle, right? Well, not anymore. At Quinto Andar, we make it seamless from end to end. And we start with search. So our search is much better than those online classifieds. We have much more information about uh, every single apartment. The uh, professional pictures, apartments are verified. You can book a visit if you want. You, can, you want to visit that apartment tomorrow morning at 9 a.m.? OK, just book it. There will be a real estate agent waiting for you there tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. And if you like that apartment, you just pull your phone off your pocket and negotiate with the landlord directly in minutes. It takes minutes instead of days to negotiate. So all the process, it's very easy, everything online. You sign it online, and you're hours right, uh, from, from getting your keys and be authorized to move in. And after you move in, if you need us, we'll be there to support you if there's any problem. So this made renting easier and faster, but there is a next step. We are making the properties much better now. So we're using. Uh, Data. We have more data than any other company in Latin America for sure, probably worldwide, about who is renting what. We know the renter's profile, we know the renter's family profile, we know how much money they make, we know where they want to live, we know which uh, features of the apartment they are looking for. So we can use all this data to renovate specific apartments in key regions of every city and making these apartments well targeted for these renters specifically. This increases the liquidity of the apartments. So this is good for the, of course, it's good for the landlord because it increases ROI and liquidity is increased, right? It's good for the renters because the renters will live where they want. They'll find good apartments to live. It's good for the uh, real estate agents that show the apartments because, well, they make more money by the end of the month. So now, renting is a good user experience. Thank you. So our next founder counts Siemens as both a partner and as an investor in her cybersecurity company. Their aim is to keep the world's industrial control networks safe. So please welcome Chief Business Officer and co-founder of Clarity, Galina Antova. Good afternoon, Toronto. I hope you're enjoying this wonderful conference. I'm Galina Antova, I'm co-founder of Clarity, and our mission is to protect the industrial networks that run the world's infrastructure. Everything from nuclear power plants to manufacturing to actually the lights in this room is operated by operating technology networks that are currently invisible to the security teams. This is the challenge that Clarity is solving. As a company, we've been very fortunate to get at the market at a point where it was the inflection point. So over the last four and a half years, we've raised a couple of rounds of financing for a total of $99 million of some of the best strategic investors in the world, including Siemens, Rockwell Automation, Schneider Electric. And I'm very fortunate to be working with an amazing group of individuals. Uh, recently, we had the privilege to have Admiral Mike Rogers, the former director of the NSA, retired now, uh, join our advisory board. And my co-founders and myself come from diverse backgrounds um, to create unique solutions. We're about 130 people right now, um, based out of New York, but operating globally. The market traction that we have to date signifies the size of the opportunity and the size of the need that those markets are experiencing right now. We count amongst our customers a lot of the Fortune 500s around the world. Production installations in 14 different verticals in 20 different countries on six continents. The challenge we're addressing is relatively simple but very complex to address. In the enterprise IT domain, as networks and computing evolved, so did offense and so did defense. 
So for the last 25 years, offense and defense has been playing catch up. In industrial operating space, things have been much more challenging. Why? Because those networks run on legacy networks. Life cycles of 25, 35 years, making patching almost impossible. So the protection of those networks is much more challenging to implement in reality. Not to mention that every large enterprise in the world needs connectivity, which of course is introducing additional attack vectors. And on top of that, we've got a very, very active threat landscape. So how are we changing that and how are we addressing it? Clarity took advantage of the opportunity. We walked into networks that had pretty much no cybersecurity products installed. And so we addressed the number one challenge of the security teams. That was, how can you provide me with an integrated platform that addresses all of my use cases and plugs and play into my existing cybersecurity infrastructure? Everything from visibility to the discovery of those assets to the actual protection. We're very fortunate to be working with a lot of the technology leaders in the world, uh, some of the very, very large names. And again, the unique positioning of our company is that we're able to come into large enterprises, install our technology in the operational technology networks, and provide the same uh, scope of use cases that security teams are used to having in their enterprise networks. Therefore, integrating everything across IT and OT. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day. Um. So now we're going to hear from the creator of a software platform that runs new mobility services such as car sharing, ride sharing, and autonomous fleet management. So all the way from San Francisco and fresh from raising $80 million in funding, please welcome the CEO of RideCell, Arjave Trivedi. Hi. My name is Arjav Trivedi. I'm the founder and CEO of RideCell. Uh, we build a platform that allows the fastest growing car sharing and ride sharing companies in the world to accelerate on the path to profitability. Um, so if you've been following the IPOs and uh, all of the success that some of these leaders have had, um, you know, it's, it's amazing to see more and more people adopt shared mobility, but profitability remains a challenge, right? Um, so one of the reasons we are able to do a good job here is we, we started the company in 2009 and, and actually ran uh, a, car share, a ride sharing service ourselves. Uh, we were actually the first company to get a permit uh, from California. We, uh, and, and we have used our own experience in, in this business uh, and scaled up. We now have operations in four countries across three continents. Uh, and we work with a, a large number of customers. So here's the, 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 the graph that you know, m almost all of our customers are, are focused on, right? Uh, essentially, the number of miles driven by shared mobility vehicles is expected to become you know, more than a third of the total miles driven um, in, in these markets. And today, that, that, that share is very, very small, significantly less than 10%. Right? Now, as these companies grow, they scale, they become a more important part of our lives and our cities. Um, it's actually a pretty huge challenge that launching these businesses or, or running them you know, as hard as it is, is actually easier than the problem of making them profitable, right? If a third of our transportation is going to depend on one kind of business, then it's pretty important, you know, for, for the entire ecosystem that this, these businesses can make a profit, right? Because it has knock-on effects, not just on their investors, but on all of the stakeholders, right? From the people that make the cars to the drivers. So how do you solve this challenge? Uh, and this is sort of what Ridesell is focused on, right? Our primary uh, focus is how can we increase the utilization of these services? How can we help them decrease the cost so that they can get to profitability faster? So how do we do this? Um, at the core, we have the ability to, to sort of connect three different areas that, uh, that have seemed to be very separate areas in mobility, but they affect each other. You know, at one end is ride sharing, very fast growth, primarily focused on drivers, someone drives you. At the other end is, is car sharing, 
folks uh, like Evo here uh, or, or Reach Now or car to go you know, in the United States and Europe. Uh, you drive yourself, you pick up a car anywhere, drop it off anywhere, right? Or, or a scooter or a bicycle. And, and really at the heart of all of this is operations, right? How do you run the business? How do you manage risk, operations, fueling, maintenance uh, of, of these vehicles in a way where you can run both sides of the business profitably? And uh, you know, ultimately, you know, the world really needs to look like uh, a, a, a sort of a place where we have a, a fleet of these vehicles available as a service. And instead of having each driver for Uber or Lyft have one car, right? Uh, and if you think about it, it's sort of amazing, right? Today, the, the largest ride-sharing companies have grown to have you know, millions of drivers. But if you look at the actual utilization of their vehicles, it's actually worse than a taxi company. Now, a taxi company rents every car to at least two drivers in a day. A vast majority of ride-sharing vehicles are used by one driver. So how can we get from there to a place where in a single day, a vehicle can be used for deliveries in the morning, for, you know, by individual people maybe driving the vehicle themselves to go to work um, in the afternoon. You know, the folks can take it for appointments. Uh, in late afternoon, grocery deliveries. In the evening, maybe you take ride sharing if it's a Friday and you know, you're driven home. And, and really, all of the use cases are supported by a single fleet of vehicles, right? Operated so that you get the economies of scale. Now, this sounds like a really neat idea, and we, we, you know, uh, to be sure, we actually have customers doing 10, 15, 20 rentals per day per car. But the challenge is, how do you scale it up? And we do it by you know, actually increasing utilization. So these are the customers we work with today. Thank you. Thanks. All right, buddy. OK. So our next company has secured a whopping 28 million users for its digital fitness app, and it's only five years old. And after five years of bootstrapping this company, they've recently raised $45 million. To discuss this and more, all the way from Munich, Germany, please welcome the CEO of Freeletics, Daniel Sabani. According to the World Health Organization, global obesity rates have tripled since 1975. So fitness is more important than ever, yet so many of us are struggling with this topic. Why is this? I would have expected some sound. So the main prerequisite for any type of success is commitment. Yet in our tech-enabled world, committing and actually following through is more difficult than ever. And even if you commit, there is no guarantee for success. So discover how Freeletics helps its users to commit and how we use AI-powered, hyper-personalized training plans to make sure that you get the goals out of our workout. Find out how we successfully installed a very intense no-excuses mantra with our users, and how we are building a global movement of users that come together, support each other, motivate each other, both online and offline. Six years ago, Freeletics didn't exist, and we're really humbled by the positive resonance and feedback that we're getting so far. Despite being bootstrapped up until last year, and despite taking on a different approach, one where we don't try to avoid the effort, but push our users to put in the effort, despite this, we're seeing continuous high growth on our platform, and Right now, we are already at 4 million workouts and 6 million social interactions per month. But this is clearly, very clearly, just the beginning. To deliver on our mission, we need to provide our users with so much more 
That's why end of 2018 we raised our $45 million Series A to build the future of fitness. And if you're interested in how we got to where we are now and what actually the future of fitness is, it would be great to see as many as you as possible tomorrow on the golf stage at 1.30. Thank you. Okay, our next company is from right here in Toronto, just uh, from King Street, as a matter of fact. They closed their uh, successful $65 million round with, uh, I'm told, no pitch deck and one meeting. To tell us how he's using AI to disrupt the legal world, please welcome co-founder of Kira Systems, Noah Weisberg. Hi, I'm Noah Weisberg, co-founder and the CEO of Kira Systems. Prior to this, I was a mergers and acquisitions lawyer at Wild Gottschall in New York City. And in that job, I spent a lot of time reviewing contracts and then as I got more senior, supervising people reviewing contracts. And I came to realize three things. First, that people spent huge amounts of time reviewing contracts. Second, that even though you had people at really fancy law firms who went to great schools and got great grades at those schools, they still made mistakes when they did this really important work. The third thing was figuring out that they tended to be looking through contracts for the same things over and over again when they reviewed them. And so because people were looking through contracts for the same things over and over again, we thought there was an opportunity to build software to help them find that stuff and pull it out. So back in January 2011, I got together with my co-founder, Dr. Alexander Hudak. And Alex has a PhD in computer science from the University of Waterloo. And we thought from talking with Alex and other guys with PhDs and comp sci from Waterloo, that it would be four months to get software to do what we needed it to do, pulling data out of contracts. And so we thought it would take us about six months to raise money plus four months to build the software or just four months to build the software. And so we decided not to raise money and just to go and start building. And so we got to work and about six months in, not four months because you're building software and everything takes a little bit longer, we realized that the problem was a lot harder than we thought. And at that point, Alex's new estimate was that it was going to be anywhere from another three months to 10 years. But he was pretty sure within 10 years, he'd lick the problem. And so at that point, we realized we had no chance of raising money, that there's no way that you could go to a VC and say, well, like sometime in the next 10 years, we're going to nail this problem and it's going to be great. We did not think that would be a very compelling pitch. So we just kept our heads down and kept working. And by spring of 2013, so about two and a half years, the software started to work pretty well to the point that our customers now tell us they review contracts in 20 to 90% less time and that they do it with the same or even greater accuracy. Uh, but back then, in spring 2013, we had a problem, which was we'd solved this really hard technical problem, but no one was paying us any money. And we didn't think that was about to change immediately. So we went deeper into savings, hired a couple additional developers, and eventually uh, people started paying us. We got a bit of revenue by late 2013, and then summer 2014, things started to go right. And we went from being a four-person company like five years ago today to eight people by the end of 2014 to like 35 people by the end of 2016 and so on uh, up to the point where when we raised our first outside capital from inside venture partners this past summer, we were about 100 or 110 people. Uh, we've continued to grow. We're now about 160 people. A majority of the world's largest law firms use our software, and so do some 8,000 professionals at Deloitte and lots and lots of companies, too. Um, that is the Cura System story. Uh, we think we still have a lot more to come in it, and I am very excited for that. Thank you. Good, huh? 
All right, you're going to meet a company now that's attempting to disrupt how you and I buy insurance. Slice Labs has built a platform where customers can buy on-demand, pay-per-use insurance. Please welcome from a New York City base, but a Toronto resident CEO of Slice Labs, Tim Atia. Hello everyone, I'm Tim Atia, CEO and co-founder of Slice. Slice is on-demand insurance uh, for the new economy. Think Uber, Lyft drivers, Airbnb hosts, and even cyber insurance. Um, we, uh, we have um, offices in New York City, uh, London, England, uh, Toronto, Ottawa, and Cleveland. Uh, we've raised uh, 40 million through two rounds of funding, our seed in Series A, and uh, we were founded just over uh, three years ago. So why Slice? We live in an on-demand world. You press on a button and a car shows up. The insurance experience can't be press on a button, fill out 10 pages, call a call center, and wait two weeks for us to send you a bunch of paper in the mail. Insurance needs to be instant. In order to get there, we had to reimagine and rethink everything. We had to come up with a completely new business model for insurance. We founded uh, Insurance uh, Slice on one simple question. What if insurance could be turned on and off like a light? Insurance needs to react to real-time signals and events. It, e it has to react to data coming out of your car, out of your home, out of IoT devices, um, out weather. Um, you know, how it, it, it really needs to be real-time. How big is this opportunity? I think everybody knows insurance is big. It's a $5 trillion industry. McKinsey pegs this opportunity at $280 billion. Uh, in order to accelerate ourselves into this market, uh, we launched Slice Insurance Cloud Services um, about a year ago, which, allows, which is our digital insurer as a service offering that allows insurers and other platforms to take advantage of this opportunity. Slice Insurance Cloud Services allows our partners to be able to focus on the customer journey. If you have a Tesla, you're very happy you have a Tesla, and insurance needs to be part of that experience. Um, we're already seeing significant impact in the market, where, uh, as an example, we put out a cyber, an on-demand digital cyber product in the US last year with AXA, the largest global insurer, and we're seeing some you know, pretty incredible results. Uh, that has led to us expanding, uh, expanding globally uh, quite quickly. We're working with uh, Munich Re, the largest global reinsurer. We're working with AXA globally. We're working with Sampo uh, in, in Japan. We're working with Progressive Insurance, one of the largest auto writers in the US. And Legal in General in the UK and Canada, we're working with, with Duo. Um, that has led to, uh, from our perspective, significant growth and uh, at, at, I would say, high margins. Uh, where is Slice going next? We think that um, insurance is going to be about predicting losses and being able to protect people um, through services. And uh, it, it, to that point, we last, earlier this year, we launched Slice Mind, which is our division focused on the intersection between um, basically data, AI, ML, and uh, behavioral psychology. In the future, insurance will be in life. It will be embedded in life. It will be part of the mobility industry. It will be part of housing. It will be part of travel and leisure. And you're basically going to subscribe for insurance, and you're going to be protected. Whether you're a person or a business, you're just going to be protected. Uh, will there be a protected for free button? Uh, you know, I think why not? Um, we welcome you to come and uh, talk to us as we uh, work with startups as well as incumbents. Thank you very much. Good job. That's great job. Okay, our final company uh, from Sa Silicon Valley, from San Francisco, Palo Alto area. Our final company will take us into the world of cybersecurity and fraud prevention. 4IQ has built a powerful tool to find stolen identities on the deep and dark web and alert those who are at risk. 
Please welcome their CEO, Monica Paul, to the stage to tell us more. Should I go up here? All right. Hello. Good afternoon. So I'm going to talk about turning the tables with exposed identities. What does that mean? I'll talk to you. I'll tell you about it. We have, um, for IQ, over the last few years, you know, you know all the headlines that are happening of all the breaches out there? We've been systematically hoovering up that data because eventually it all ends up in open sources out on the internet. And last year, we found over 14 billion identity records exposed from over 12,000 separate files, separate packages, all circulating in, on the internet, on the dark web. And so if you think about all those breaches that have happened, uh, basically, you know, we're all exposed. Simple. It's just there. And in fact, this is again public. Mark there uh, is also exposed in all these breaches. And also public was the fact that, like all of us, he too used the same password in different accounts. Okay. And so what we've done is we've been going around there collecting all of these packages, We've been screening all the fake stuff out, you know, removing duplicates, et cetera, curating the stuff. Because a lot of these packages, you know, they come and they go. They're transient. If you were to look for them today, you may not necessarily find that information. The hackers know this. And what they're doing is they're hoovering stuff up as well. And they're using it for identity theft. So they're using that personal information to open accounts, file fake tax returns, um, uh, maybe even get medical procedures under your uh, health insurance. Uh, they're going into your emails. They're looking at their, your information. They're going into your bank accounts. They're transferring cash. Uh, some of them might be, you know, uh, holding you for ransom. Uh, and so, what again? What we're doing is, after we hoover all this information, we're sending alerts out. So we don't uh, directly work with consumers, but we work with the identity theft service providers who essentially package both dark web monitoring, credit score monitoring, and insurance for consumers. So that when you get an alert, you, can, you know, okay, I have to go change my password. I have to hopefully put on, you know, add two-factor authentication. But more important, also be on the watch out for social engineering scams. Recently, really exciting, we've also discovered that this data can be used to connect the dots between fake and real identities. So for example, Alphabay was a big dark market, and the system admin, the administrator of that dark market was Pimp Alex. Well, we were able to very quickly turn the tables and use this data to find, to unmask uh, his real identity and his company, the front that he was using. So again, it took law enforcement a lot of time to do this in the past. With this capability, this new forensics capability now, this is much uh, more easily possible. And so we're helping banks with fraud uh, investigations, financial crime investigations, helping companies help consumers and also alerting consumers of this information. There is so much at risk and just really excited that we're part of the solution. You know, security is, is something that all of us have to take responsibility for. Cus companies have to take responsibility for their consumers. And, uh, you know, uh, government has to do their part as well. So, thank you. <laughs>